be the center of your joy tonight. Say, praise the, praise the Lord. Did you bring your Bibles? Let's see your Bibles. Oh, you've got them ready. I'm so proud of you. God bless you. Do you believe your Bibles? Amen. That little 12-year-old girl walked up to this kind of liberal preacher <clears throat> after the service, and she looked right at him, and she said, Preacher, you preached on the story of Jonah and the whale, about the whale swallowing to Jonah, and I sort of picked up on while you were preaching that, that you don't really believe that that whale swallowed Jonah. And he said, well, do you believe that? She said, I most certainly do. And he said, well, how do you know it's true? And she says, because it says so in my Bible, and that makes it true for me. And he said, well, now, God uh, used men to write that Bible over a period of about 1,500 years, and they could have been wrong. You'll have to give me something better than that. And she said, well, I just know down in my heart that that's true, and that's good enough for me. He said, yeah, but the Bible itself says that your heart is desperately wicked and deceitful and who can know it you'll have to give me something better than that and she said well when I get to heaven I'll ask Mr. Jonah and he'll tell me it's true and then he said yes but what if when you get to heaven what if Mr. Jonah isn't there and she said then you ask him Richard and I lump all liberals into that camp. I'm so glad tonight. You know, we've got one preacher off the clock, another one just about to come on the clock, and another one on overtime. <laughs> we got to cut out that overtime. <clears throat> I had a rather family reunion today and two birthdays this afternoon down at a lake in St. Genevieve County and uh, I wanted to come back tonight and just preach like a crow fighting a windstorm but I don't think maybe God wants me to do that anymore. I want to use these last two services. By the way, I'll be preaching of course tonight and next Sunday morning. Next Sunday night Anna Vaughn will be devoting the evening worship hour to her experiences in the Dominican Islands, bringing slides and pictures and testimony. Now you come, you come next Sunday night to hear this express visit of the Holy Spirit through Anna's heart to your heart about those mission experiences. If you were here for world changers, when they left and when they got home, you know that this is changing not only that part of the world where they went, but it's changing our church too. I want to compliment you. You've had some superb leadership at this church to prepare people and, a, and young people to go on these mission streams. Don't stop that. Keep sending the kids around the world. Every chance they get to go, if they feel led to go, you help them go just like you did. You be sure and be here next Sunday night. That'll be my last public worship service with you. I'm on the clock through... September 6th. So if you have any needs you have between now and Saturday, September 6th, then our pastor, Brother Odell Beecham and his beautiful wife are going to be here. To, in fact, they're going to be here, I think, maybe the 2nd of September to start putting their boots in the stirrups. And I want to help him all that he wants me to until I'm gone on the 6th. But this has been a beautiful trip for this preacher. And uh, you've been so kind to me. And I know you were kind to Dr. Richard Adams. Now you just bundle those two things together, all those 26 years that you loved Richard and Ann, and the three months that you've treated me better than I ever deserved, truly. And you wrap that in a package and hand it to the Beechams. Treat them that way. There's no end to what this church can do. Before we try to preach, may we try to pray. Father, I thank you for the softness that we feel here tonight, the gentleness, the shepherd like considerateness the agape love that is your kind. 
superimpose, sir, yourself on this service tonight. Wrap your eternal, everlasting, uplifting, absolute, immutable arms around each one of us. Lord, we all need a hug from heaven tonight. Whether we're at our best or at our worst, there's never an instant in history now or forever that we don't need that absolute acknowledgement of your divine presence right within our being. So put your hand in the midst of our fiber tonight. Change us. Some of us came tonight feeling like we wanted to come back to church. Not only was it our duty, but it's our delight to come because you're here and your Holy Spirit moistens our hearts, rains upon our lips, gathers us in like a hen gathering her chicks. When the hawks of the air dive bomb our lives, would you give us the energy to fly above them? Help us to keep soaring like the eagles, up and up and up until we're out of reach of Earth's trauma. And help us to spend every breathing, living moment that each one of us have left on this Earth. Please, Lord, to tell someone else about you so they'll have this same assurance of Jesus the Christ in their hearts that we have. In Christ's name we pray, and amen. Would you turn with me in your Bibles, please, to the book of Romans, the book of Romans chapter 12. I, want, I wish to be more tender than tough tonight, more absolute than honest and deliberate, but without being abusive. God never intends for a preacher to be abusive. I think about all those years when I thought it was my job to win every soul to Jesus and keep every church in line, and none of that worked. But this will work. I don't know how your home is. It's really none of my business unless you come and ask me to pray for you or to help in something. By the way, little sidebar in parentheses here, I love this music, and I, I love all of these guys. They're up here trying, doing a good job. And I'm going to use the expression in the vernacular, old Jim Barry. I think more of him every time I hear him play. You know why? He's a good musician. Good musician. But he's better than that in here. When I get a telephone call from a man, and I got one from Jim, and I won't carry it too far, but it was an attempt to get the interest on the part of an interim pastor to assist in a problem that was confronting Jim, not his own, just someone else that had come to him. By the way, Jim, publicly, nobody will know anyway. I've got an appointment to go there this coming Thursday again. And when some of the leadership say, Preacher, would you go visit so-and-so? By the way, Karen, I'm on my way to the one you gave me. But keep doing that. You're getting the kind of a pastor, I have no doubt, that wants your input and will want to kneel in prayer with you about the requests that you have all over the community. But don't work him to death. I mean, get out there and say, if you can't go, I'm going anyway. And this place will be so full. Do you know this place can be full by Christmas? I mean, full, full. My father-in-law, he's younger than I am. He was here this morning. And uh, he said, Brother Bob, how many people were here this morning? I said, oh, I don't know, Brother Don, about 800 it was a good crowd, what he said. I didn't change my figure either. 
because that's what ought to be here. So let's have a minimum of 800 on the 7th of September. That'll be so easy. If all of us here bring five, you know what that'll do? You'll have to sit outside Sunday, the 7th. The 12th chapter of the book of Romans. I want to try to exegete a few verses, just give you a blow-by-blow -blow description from six verses. I'm going to read maybe 20. But out of those six, I want to show you what God has shown me about how to get along with people. Now, if you're expecting some big, deliberate, long process discourse tonight that I've gone through to get some information, that's not going to be the case. This is so simple. You want to get along with somebody at home? Maybe you like your spouse? Or figure out what to say and do with the kids, the children? Here's the answer. Just so simple. Save yourselves $125 an hour from some psychiatrist's office and read this chapter. It shows you just exactly what to do with people problems. How to handle people. How to get along with people. I have no a doubt that some of you are doing a, an exemplary job of this. But if we're dead gun barrel honest, we'll have to admit during each week, things come up where we fail miserably at our associational level. I mean associations with people. On the job, at home, in school, in church. That's the worst place for it to happen. Brother, it's better to go home than cry than it is to stand in church and fight. Amen? Living the Christian life. Are you serious about it? I want to give you an introduction. The first eight verses of chapter 12, I want to give this to you fast and then give you the six things on how to get along with people. But uh, here's the old apostle Paul writing this to that Roman Christian church. And uh, I think I, I wrote in my flyleaf for my help, since God has shown great mercy, and that's what chapter 11 is all about and even before, but since God has shown such great mercy, then in chapter 12, Paul begins by saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, and beseech in the well, in the English word I transliterated out of the Greek text means, I beg you if I have to for you to get you to do this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And where he says, I beg you, I beseech you, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies. Present is, is the word partizomai. It means to offer. It means uh, to yield your body. This Christian life is a life of yielding every day, offering something every day to someone else, particularly and first of all to God. But present your body. Yield it. Partizomai. It means just give yourself over to God and everybody about you for the glory of God. Now, if you're selfish and stingy and there isn't anything that will cause selfishness or stinginess worse than unbelief, some of us pride ourselves in believing that we really believe, that we hold firmly to the Bible, and we do, but we're failing so miserably in presenting the outward appearance of what we say has happened inwardly, that metamorphosis that's taken place inside just hasn't showed up out there like God intends for it to in our lives. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you partizomai, present your bodies a living sacrifice. And let me hit it fast. Aren't you glad that you don't have to come on Sunday morning with anything except a little old green envelope to put a dime or a dollar or whatever in the offering plate? You don't have to bring a bullock. You don't have to cart a, a goat in here or a turtle dove. You don't have to come and see some priest and say, look, would you burn, th burn this on the altar? I, I've sinned this last week, and I want you to give this to God according to the laws of burnt offering. And that's what they did. They'd bring those animals, those animal sacrifices in, lay them on the altar. The priest had wood around there, started a fire with that animal on that altar after the Le Levitical priesthood would bring by, it's gross, but they'd bring by a sharp knife, cut that animal's throat, and it bled to death on the altar. They started the fire. The fire would burn up the wood and the offering, the animal and everything, and uh, they believed, and I believe it too, 
that when God's great nostrils picked up the scent of the obedience of that offering, that sacrifice, he knew that they were trying to keep the law, and that was right then. But then he sent Jesus. No more bullocks, no more rams, no more turtle doves. You come, man, woman, boys, girls, you and me come and present ourselves living sacrifices to God. You've heard me say until I know I've worn it out, but I'm going to keep saying it everywhere I go. God's not interested in dead sacrifices. He doesn't want your dead body upon an altar. He wants your living life for the Lord Jesus Christ. The trouble with living sacrifices when they come to present themselves to God, they have a way of crawling off the altar. They make their commitment, and then they don't keep it. Some of you sitting right here tonight, have, I just know, I know people, I know me. You committed yourself to teach a class or to tithe or to do something for God in His church, and you've never really gotten around to it yet. Well, God wants you and me to present our bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable. The word acceptable means pleasing, wholly pleasing, and it will if you do that, unto God which is your reasonable service. Reasonable is the Greek word logikos. You know what it means? It means rational. Nothing irrational about it. Just do it. Just do it. It's a reasonable thing that God's requesting. Let's hurry on to verse 2. Verse 2 says, and be not conformed to this world. World in this part of the text is the word aeon. And what it literally means is don't let your lives be dictated by this evil world system. Come on now. If you don't go home tonight and pray before you go to bed and open this book up and say, God, give me energy through the night to get up tomorrow and then I'll get your book again and wash myself in a chapter tomorrow and I'll have, I'll have the energy and the will and the, the rationale to do your work tomorrow. Be not conformed to this world. Don't let this world dictate to you, this evil world system. If you haven't figured that out yet, then stop and think about it, because tomorrow when you hit a stone wall, I don't care what your wife said to you when you went to work. If you hit a stone wall tomorrow, don't blame it on her. Blame it on, did you make contact with God this morning so that you'd be able to pass by every stone barrier that you come to, which is your reasonable service? You're supposed to be a living sacrifice unto God and your wife and your kids and your family and your job and your church, and every obstacle on the way tomorrow is part of that. That's your rational, rational reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's that word again that we studied last word, week. Transformed comes from the same root word that transfigured comes from, where Jesus was changed. He had that outward manifestation, but it obviously came because of an inward change. He was God in the person of Jesus, and he was transfigured. He was metamorphosized. He, metamorpho is the word. That's the word here. But be ye transformed by the, re, by the renewing of your mind. Mind is the word, I'll get off of this in a minute. It's the word noose. I want you to learn something. N-O-U-S. It's the center of logical reasoning and moral awareness, and it must be changed if we are to live a life acceptable to God. God bless us, change our minds about some things. This is a wonderful church, and you have a right to be wrong about some things, and brother, you are. And I am too. We're all in the same boat together. I don't care if you're preaching or praying or teaching a Sunday school class, scooping off the sidewalks, fixing the steeple, painting the hallways, or just coming like a faithful servant and sitting and praying and loving everybody. We're all in this boat together, every single one of us. And when you get that concept, you won't be mad, you won't be jealous. You'll be happy to be here and you'll bring somebody with you. Oh, he says, uh, if you just do that, you'll prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then very quickly, I'm just going to read verse 3 through 8 and not say anything, believe it or not. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members of another. 
having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let me camp there for just a minute and say here where he talks about showing mercy with cheerfulness. Just so simple. Don't do it because you have to. Just don't do this Christian work because you feel you have to. Do it with cheerfulness. And then you can wait on your paycheck up there with mercy. Okay, verses 9 through 21, and I'm only going to use six verses here as far as zeroing in on them, but let me get started in verse 9. Now this is, we're trying to get along with people, aren't we? Trying to figure people out, trying to be kind to people, helpful to people, how to handle people. I've never figured this out yet. I'm working on it. Let love be without dissimulation. You know what that really means? God bless you. It's so simple. I don't know what your version or text or whatever it is says, but it simply means when Paul wrote this to the Roman church, he knew that they had problematic people just like all of us are in all of God's time. He said, please, folks, let your love be real. That's what it means. Let your love be without dissimulation. Let it be real. I think about the little boy that was being continually taunted in his neighborhood by other neighborhood children, and they were saying to him, why, you're a little Christian. Why, doesn't, why don't you ask your God to tell some of his friends to send you some shoes? You want to know what his pathetic answer was? He says, I think God does tell them, but they don't listen. God has told us to love one another. God has told us to let our love be real, not for some profit. Let it be without dissimulation. I'm glad Paul started this, this part of the chapter this way because that's where it starts and stops, with the love of God through Christ in your heart and mind. I know some of you love each other. I hear you. I'm not as deaf and dumb as I act at times. And I hear you out in the hallways, and I hear you saying things about so-and-so and other people and I think it's wonderful. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Abhor is the English word better translated for me at least. Hate that. Hate that which is evil. And uh, cleave to that which is good. Cleave is an original word, explains it to me better too. It means... Uh, well, it's proskalao, and it means hold on tight, brother, to that which is good. Some of you believe it, but God bless you, you're not acting like it. Some of you believe it, but you're not practicing it. Proskalao, cleave to that. Hold tight to the things in your life, in your home, in your workplace, and in your church house that are good. Hold on to them. The devil will always be on the other end tugging in this tug of war trying to get you away from that. Hold on to that which is good. Okay, here they are. Six things. Verse 10 is the first one. You want to get along with people? You want to handle people problems? It starts with you and with me in our relationship right here with each other. I'm not too hot at this job. That's becoming conspicuously more obvious every day. But I am called to preach the gospel and adjured by God to love the people to whom he's called me to preach, whether you're right or wrong. I don't, I care, but I'm not going to center on that. And I pray that you won't center on whether I'm right or wrong about everything. God has to settle the dust in the end. And you better wake up and smell that rose because that's what he's going to do one of these days. He's going to be the eternal judge of everything that passes through our minds or wherever, any thought, word, or deed, idle or otherwise. He's going to bring it into judgment. So verse 10, he says, folks, you want to handle people problems, then be affectionate. Be affectionate. Verse 10, be kindly affectioned to one another with brotherly love. Like brothers and sisters, 
That's what the original text really conveys. Do it like brother. Well, you say, well, I fought with my brother and sister my whole life. What does he mean by that? I did with mine too. Don and I were out under that old shade tree in the corner of the yard with a pile of dirt about that deep. We had little wooden cars that we had carved out. I had the bigger cars. He didn't like it. He was a year and a half younger than me. I'd drive my cars over him, and he'd take a little bit of dirt and throw it in my face. And when he did that, I took both of my hands, and I really gave him a bath. And then the dust was swirling, man. And Mom would come out the door, and when we saw her come out, you'd think she's coming out to get a hold of us. She didn't come to us at all. She went over to that big willow tree and got a long willow switch about that big around, and we looked at each other and said, Code Red, nobody would run. Nobody would run when she ran to that willow tree. Be, uh, be affection one to another like with brotherly love, like brothers and sisters. And I love this. You want to get along with somebody? In honor preferring one another. Give more honor. Give more honor than you want for yourself. You know that's not too tough. It's right here. I know you came tonight thinking you're going to get a great discourse. All I'm giving is what Paul told those Roman Christians. And they were right in the shadow of, of Pharaoh. Excuse me, Caesar. Right there in Rome. Just be affectionate one toward another. Verse 11 says, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. This isn't part of my six reasons, but I'm going to throw it in. Don't be a lazy Christian. I know a lot of preachers in the United States of America and overseas. And God knows my heart. You'll meet it at the judgment. I don't judge any of them. Don't judge any of them. God will have to deal with God, same as I will. But I'm not blind. And I just can hardly stand it when one of my brother preachers has gone all the way to the top of the academic ladder, and he's got a good church and sitting behind a big plush desk and never moves. I just don't like lazy preachers. I don't like lazy Christians. I don't like anything that's lazy. I've been whipped by my dad's razor strap more for what he called lazy than I'm never starting that again. And the Bible says, the Bible says, not slothful in business. This is God's business. Sunday school starts at 9.30. Get here before 9.30. Get your class ready. Shake their hands when they come in the door. There's two people in this church that I really love. One is a, a man that's a, almost bald-headed, stands at that door out there and greets me when I come in every Sunday. I know more and hit the door, and he opens it for me. Can you believe that? Then there's a woman inside, hands me a bulletin. I'm so glad to see you preachers. You know what that does for me? That's just sick them. Come on to church. Do that. Don't be slothful in business. Get here ahead of time. Get everything on, on, on scale. Do it fast. Don't be lazy in, in the business of the Lord. That's the greatest business in the world. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Do it with all your heart, sweat form. Now look at the second uh, way to get along with people in verse 12. The second way is be prayerfully patient. Come on, verse 12. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in trials, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. I said to you before, say it again. Patience is not waiting. Patience is how you act while you're waiting. Patient in spirit. How long, God, are we going to have to go through this anyway? That's kind of a futile prayer. Patient in spirit. I wrote in my flyleaf, this world is not intolerable. This world is in process right now, and we're here to help. Instant in prayer. Every moment. How often do you pray? Don't tell me because I'm, I'm too legalistic at this point. I really am. I really think I ought to pray as soon as I blink my eyes in the morning, then I think I ought to pray if I have a cup of coffee. 
and then I need to pray at 9 o'clock, and at 12 noon, and at 3 p.m., and at 6 p.m., at every meal time, and at bedtime, and every other time that anybody comes to see me or calls me on the phone, I'm supposed to be praying. That's kind of a legalistic attitude I have, but that's not what Paul's talking about. He means be instant in prayer, all the time be in an attitude of prayer, live in a level and vein of prayer, all the time be centered on God. Let your noose, your logical reasoning system be coupled to God all the time. I didn't tell you this morning that some of you don't even know this, that Southern Baptist missionaries two or two and a half years ago, about 20 of them were dispatched to the Ukraine. And they flew over there in an airplane, got off the plane, got on a bus, about 20 of them headed for the Ukrainian border. Their visas were all in order. The Foreign Mission Board had, had arranged all of the paperwork. Everything was in order. When they got off the bus and got to, to the guard gate where they were going to finally go across into Ukraine, the guards abruptly and rather, not violently, but vehemently, get out of here, get back on your bus and get out of here right now. And that's all the explanation they gave them. Why? Well, what's going on? Just get out of here. They got on the bus, went back to the plane. When they got back to that airplane, somehow or another, I don't have all the details, but word got back that there was a civil and military uprising and strife in Ukraine that was slaughtering hundreds of people. And churches just like First Baptist Church, Festus Crystal City, all over the country that knew about that group going over there were praying for them that God would protect them and provide for them, bring them over there safely, bring them home safely. And when they got there, they didn't understand, but they couldn't go into that land. Had they gone, they would have probably all been killed. Be in an instant season of prayer. Those kids in Iraq tonight, which one's next? Which one's next? That's closer to me than I want to discuss. Be prayerfully patient. Verse 13 says, distributing to the necessity of the saints and given to hospitality. Simply means share with God's people. Given to the necessity. You see somebody in this church that really needs something. By the way, if you've been wondering about somebody that really does, I know several that do. I'm not going to come and tell you. But if you said to me, preacher, do you know somebody that could really use some help? I sure do. Paul says we're to that bunch in Rome. He said, give to those other brothers and sisters that really, and I know we got a lot of people that do that. I've seen it happen in my own presence where some of you gave like that. given to hospitality, not just to each other, but stop under a bridge one of these days. And if you're scared, get somebody that looks human, that's coming down the street and ask him if he'll give this $5 bill or this $20 bill to that man laying under the bridge there at 17th and Franklin on the corner in St. Louis. Given to hospitality. Oh, preacher, he'll just take it and go to Glove Drug Store and get a fifth of whiskey. I know, that's what a lot of them will do but I'm giving it as unto the Lord and let the results be up to God. Verse 14. Verse 14 is the third thing. Third way to get along with people is bless your persecutors. Look at verse 14. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. You know what he means by that? Wish them well. Somebody just takes it out on you, brother and scours you down from the top to the bottom, in your heart, in your head, just takes you over the coals and gives you a lashing every way that you can. What do you do? Knock them down. No, no. Bless them. Wish them well. If that's really the way you feel, sir, I'm very sorry. And if I've contributed to that attitude or feeling, please forgive me. But I wish you well and go your way. Bless your persecutors. Verse 15 says, Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. I love that verse. Try to practice it. I'm sure that you do too. Verse 16 is the fourth way. 
the fourth way to deal with people. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, and be not wise in your own conceits. Make friends with those who seem unimportant. That's what he's saying. I've been here three months, just about. I love all of you. I'm, I'm not trying to get anything out of this. I want to just leave here with a love affair and people having been saved. But the people I love most in this church as a human being and a preacher, and I've got a right to feel this way, are those that come bust in over here, transported to this church, those unimportant people that God sends. One came out this morning. All of you say such nice things. Thank you. I don't deserve it, but thank you. This one came out, one of these blessed bust-in boys. And he put his hand on my shoulder, and he says, Thank you, blah, blah, blah. I love you. I love you, but I don't love you that much. Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not things, high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. You know, verse 17 to me, you translate it any way you want to, but it mean, to me it means keep your word. Keep your word and do what's right. Oh, I transgressed that order, that law, that commandment so terribly years ago. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Do what is right with everyone, no matter who it is. Verse 18 says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. What does that mean? Do your best to get along with everybody. There's some rascals in this life. And part of them are in church. What do you do with those guys, preacher? Just, well, just there he is, and he's causing all kinds of trouble. I'm the pastor here. I'll take care of him. Oh, no. What if God had done that to us? Hi, Bob. That's how easy it would be for him. But he's just totally opposite of that. And that's what he wants out of you and me, if it be possible, as much as life in you, as very best you can, live peaceably with all men. When you've done that, and the Holy Spirit's in your heart, and you know it, that's all you have to do. You do your best to make peace with everybody. Here's the fifth thing real fast, verse 19. Dearly beloved, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I'll repay, saith the Lord. Don't try to punish others. God, wait on God to punish them. And that's the word. He will. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Don't you do it. For it's written, God said, I'll guarantee you, mister, if you'll take your hands off that situation, vengeance is mine. I'll repay, saith the Lord. In the three months that I've been here, a situation came up that did not, did not involve this church whatsoever. But what it really amounted to was Satan trying to detour and distract and destroy me as he's done for, for the nearly 60 years I've been saved. And there really wasn't much I could do about it. Really. I would have done anything. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, I'd have paid out of it if I could. Nothing I could do about it. Except one thing. I got on my knees before God. It's only been about three weeks ago. And I'll never forget it because since I've been here, it had nothing to do with you. But I just said, Lord, 
He's back again. He's back. Satan's back. And if he can't destroy you, he can discourage you. And if you get low enough, you'll quit if you're a fool. So you get down on your knees and you cry out to him in faith, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, pastuo, clinging to, adhering to, relying implicitly upon, that will I give unto you. Call unto me, I'll answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I said, here's another one of those times, Lord. Satan's crying again, come down, come down, Bob. No. You know what I've been saying the last 35 years? I choose Jesus. I don't know if that means anything to anybody else, but it does to me. I choose Jesus. And the demons throw up their bloody, fiery elbows and back off into the pit until they come back again. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you will before your Christian life is over if you're serious about it. How to get along with people? Don't take revenge. All of that's up to God. Well, I close with this. But you should do this in verse 20. You defeat evil with good. That's how you handle these people, these problems, whatever the circumstances. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Do not overcome of evil. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't let evil defeat you. Defeat evil by doing good. You know anybody that has a rub with you? I've never been in a Baptist church in my life anywhere in the United States, and I'm going to Oklahoma City for a, a revival crusade not long after I leave here. But I'll bet you that out there, and one of the emphasis that I've already felt in my heart that I need to make in that church, in that revival coming up, is if anyone in this congregation, ladies and gentlemen, has one bit of animosity, present, past, or worried about the future, oh, someone in the church, go to them. Put your arms around them. Look, please forgive me. Would you forgive me for this relationship? that we haven't had, that we should have had, and especially the part that we should not have had. Would you forgive me for that? And God bless you, don't expect them to repent. Don't expect that. You go and forgive. When Jesus said, when you stand praying and you have ought against one another, go and, 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 and ask the other one to forgive you. And he didn't say one thing about who was right or wrong. He said, just go. You know, every time I do that, it works. When I was in the United States Air Force, another airman and I got mad, really mad. We said, we'll settle it in the ring. I'd gone out for the Air Force boxing team, got whipped so bad I quit. But I, I was kind of tough. So this man and I got mad. And we decided to settle it in the ring. The trouble was, I got saved before the ring date. And I went to him and knocked him out by asking him to forgive me. That's when I learned that. Father, swoop down tonight. This congregation and I know that you provided a a pillar of fire for probably three to six million Hebrews. Those Jews wandering out of Egypt, they didn't know where they were going. Moses felt like he did. He was following you. But it was so dark and cold at night. And the little kids must have been hungry and scared and walked all day. No house at night, couldn't see. And you put a flame, a pillar of fire in the sky to guide them every step of the way. And when the little kids got cold at night, I know you pulled the flame down a little closer to warm them. 
the next morning, when that big congregation got back up, you stuck a cloud in the sky and told Brother Moses to follow the cloud. And one day, one day, they got to the promised land. Lord, that's what we're doing tonight. We're heading for you. We're heading home to the promised land. Some of us have lost our way. It's true. We don't have a family altar anymore. We don't even personally take a deep interest in your love letter. The owner's manual, the Bible. And so we get in trouble and say we're going to start afresh, and then we don't. Oh, God, continue, sir, being merciful and long-suffering, full of grace and forgiveness and an indescribable, unfathomable love that you gave us in Jesus. Oh, remind us what you did on the cross. Remind us that the nails in his hands and his feet were our nails. The thorns in his crown, in his brow, were our thorns. Those glass pieces and rock chunks and marble chunks in the cat of nine tails, those should have been for us. But you took it. You did it when it should have been us. Help us not to forget that. And when we leave here tonight, before we leave, even now, even during the invitation, even before we shake hands and hug each other, before we go tonight, if there's one indifference that's never been settled, oh, God in heaven's name, cause the individuals to settle it tonight. And forgive my sins, Lord, lest I, after I have preached to others, just like Paul said, I myself have become a castaway. Thank you for the hope and the opportunity that's ahead of us tonight to get along with people and to learn how to handle people like you did. But it cost you your son's life. Surely, 